Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our webinar in partnership with the Craft Precision Medicine Accelerator at the Harvard Business School, exploring the frontiers of data and analytics for precision medicine. This is Emily Ball speaking from Faster Cures. Uh, we're looking forward to an engaging presentation and discussion this afternoon. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention some brief housekeeping items. So all participants are muted on entry, but you do have the ability to communicate with us here at Faster Cures by using the chat feature at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We will have a time for Q&A at the end of the presentation and we welcome your questions. So feel free to send us those by using that same chat feature. We also welcome you to join us on Twitter to follow along with the conversation and share your own voice with the discussion. Uh, you can follow along or tweet about the event using the hashtag FCWebinar. We will be tweeting from our handle at Faster Cures. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator this afternoon, Faster Cures Executive Director, Tanisha Kriya. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for being with us. My name is Tanisha Carino, and like Emily said, I'm the Executive Director of Faster Cures. I'm extremely excited that our team has the opportunity to partner with the Craft Precision Medicine Accelerator at the Harvard Business School and to bring you this webinar, webinar about the frontiers of precision medicine. By way of setting the stage, I'd like to take a minute to share some background about Faster Cures, introduce our two speakers, and talk a bit about why their work is so significant to our team and to our field. To share some context for those of you on the call this afternoon who may be new to our work, Faster Cures is driven by a singular goal, to save lives by speeding science to all patients. We host these free webinars to convene around important topics that matter to patients and stakeholders across the field and to learn more from experts with real world experience in dealing with these topics. Our hope is that the webinars provide opportunities to bring actionable knowledge to our network that can spur on medical progress by bringing to light solutions to the field's biggest challenges. On the call this afternoon, we'll have over 400 registrants from a diverse background, and it's wonderful to have so many voices on the call, all seeking to explore how data and analytics are pushing forward the field of precision medicine. But before I move on to introduce our speakers, I wanted to thread the needle on this topic and highlight why it's so critical for us at Faster Cures. One area that I know you all have been focused on, as well as us in the last year, is the role of health data. This is a particularly challenging field where there are so many sources of health data and that the data have tremendous value for improving biomedical R&D and finding cures for individual patients who need them. However, they are often disconnected from the use of this data across the healthcare system, and the majority of patients and caregivers still don't have resources to utilize their data in meaningful ways. To address these challenges, we've created at Faster Cures a project called Health Data Basics, which you can visit and learn more about at healthdatabasics.org. What we've discovered is that patient participation is so critical, and if we're going to bridge the gap between science and the results for patients themselves, we have to build a committed community of people who are dedicated to advancing patient engagement with their own data. So we're excited to see how this work with Kraft and the work that you're doing in precision medicine will bring individualized results to specific patient communities. And in the context of our own focus for the future, I'm excited to introduce you to the Kraft team who will share more about their work this afternoon. So we have the pleasure this afternoon from here, uh, of hearing from Kathy Goosey and Gabriel Escher, who are both with us today. Kathy's been a good friend of Faster Cures for over a decade. The Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, which Kathy founded, is a pioneer in the field of venture philanthropy and in sharing its experiences and resources with countless of other patient organizations. For a number of years, Kathy has been focused on the importance of high quality data and analytics in pursuit of precision medicine. Now at the Craft Precision Medicine Accelerator, she has a new perch from which to advance thinking and practice on this topic, along with many other topics. We are also delighted to have Gabriel present with us this afternoon. He has spent the last 15 years working to apply healthcare technologies to problems in the pharma biotech industry and the delivery of healthcare. Gabriel was formerly the VP of products at GNS Healthcare. Prior to that, he managed several global client programs at Patients Like Me, focused on patient-centered research and real-world outcomes. 
This afternoon, Gabriel will share the results of a very interesting and relevant landscape that Kraft has done on the sources of data for precision medicine R&D and those who provide analytical capabilities across the ecosystem. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. Thank you so much, Tanisha, and thank you, Pastor Cruz, and to all of you for joining us today. We're so excited to give you an update on the HBS Craft Precision Medicine Accelerator, and I speak today on behalf of my co-chair, Richard Hammermesh, and myself. So to give you an understanding of how the Craft Precision Medicine Accelerator got started, um, we want to thank Robert and Jonathan Kraft, who about two and a half years ago decided that they wanted to give a $20 million endowment to Harvard Business School. And that generous endowment came from the heart because Robert had lost his wife, Myra, to ovarian cancer. They had sequenced her genome and couldn't find a drug fast enough for her. And the crafts were wise enough to understand right away that while science and technology are exploding in the field, um, the business incentives aren't always keep, keeping up. So when the endowment came to the business school, we were really excited because we could use the faculty, the students, the alumni, but really focus on how do new incentives drive great models in precision medicine. For Richard and myself, we really wanted to make sure that Kraft focused on solving problems and doing it in the long haul. So we start by always creating landscapes in the precision medicine space. We then identify the leaders, the disruptors, the, the best practices, and agree on what we think the greatest problems and challenges are. We keep our teams close at hand working with us on the long haul to devise really good solutions, and then we disseminate those solutions through groups like Faster Cures to make sure that we continue to build the landscape in a really strong way. Now, when Richard and I started, we did a number of phone calls with all of the leaders in precision medicine to really understand where should we focus all of our time. And it really broke down into four different areas, and they're not surprising, but they are highly, highly integrated. The first is direct to patient. And why this was critical is if the patients don't understand the importance of their own data in their own journey and in a collective way with other data, um, we will never make precision medicine happen. The second was once the patients are able to give their data through pharmaceutical clinical trials or academic centers or foundation registries, we have to frame the questions in the right way so that we can get use cases and analytics to drive and aggregate data sets together. That in itself helps us to identify new targets and new biomarkers that we need to get into much more efficient clinical trials. And we ended up focusing specifically on platform trials, which then helped us to understand where should venture really be investing these days to drive cures forward so that we can help all of the patients who have their own journey specifically in oncology and in precision medicine. Now, what's easiest for us to do to help you to understand how the Craft Accelerator works is to walk you through each of the four work streams. But we can promise you that um, the team up here at Harvard consistently needs to make sure that we're always integrating these four work streams to drive toward cures faster. But starting um, with direct to patient, the, um, the real challenge we saw there was that cancer patients, of course, are overwhelmed, and we had done a survey and really understood that about 54% didn't know what precision medicine was, 80% weren't really familiar with the genomic testing. So thanks to Lori Marcus, who chairs this direct-to-patient work stream, we decided to reach out to five different cancer organizations who have been terrific to work with, uh, PANCAM, Breast Cancer Research Foundation, MMRF, PCF, Longevity, and together, which I, I found this so fascinating, together these five groups, chief marketing officers, digital people, get on calls every week to identify how can they really build patient engagement and retention in a precision medicine journey. And what we did um, that was so innovative and exciting was we worked with so many people in the direct-to-consumer space from Marriott, Reebok, Peloton, you name it, and they came in and really helped us to understand the engagement and retention that they all use in the retail space and the service industry so that we can understand how to apply it in healthcare. 
As a result of all this work, the five cancers then developed a program called Right Track, which is simple, but it really is meaningful. It's just saying patients have to get to the right team and academic center, understand right tests, genomic, or even immuno uh, profiling, and to the right treatment standard of care or a clinical trial. And now all of the organizations are working with a social media campaign and doing this in a really thoughtful and efficient way together. And we're analyzing the impact of the social media campaign around Right Track to say, were we able to close some of the knowledge gaps that we saw in precision medicine? Are patients much more knowledgeable about what precision medicine is, the subtypes, the testing that they need to have? Um, we'll be looking at all of the information we get. We've already published some information in the Cancer Journal, but we'll continue to publish the information we find on knowledge gaps and the closing of those gaps as time goes on. And of course, as we all know, as you move from patient engagement and retention in how you do this on social and things like Right Track, we also want to make sure we're learning how to apply it in a really thoughtful way to the patient registries. Now, the second work stream that Gabriel Eichler will be sharing with you today is around data and analytics. And the problem we were solving for here was that the data um, sets are very scattered, often siloed, although really, as, as Gabriel will share with you, many of them are starting to merge and, and come together, which is a great thing. Um, we also understand that a lot of times, if you bring in AI and machine learning companies and you frame the use case, you can, again, keep that aggregation moving and you can solve for many of the questions that our patients and other people in the ecosystem have. So today, what Gabriel will be sharing with you is an amazing amount of work that he's put into understanding the full oncology landscape. Where are these data sets? What exactly is in them? But also really exciting is also looking at the AI companies. Where are they? What are they working for? Um, so that you can start to apply these two things together, data as well as the AI companies, as well as who can fund these different programs. In addition, we also have an HBX that you can go look at um, called the Answer Fund, where we show you how the MMRF took one stab at um, analyzing its compass data um, that you might find interesting. And then Gabriel will be doing a workshop on data analytics in the first quarter of next year as well. The third work stream that we talked about then was clinical trials. And the problem we were solving for here, which we all know is the inefficiency, 20% don't fail, fail to enroll, 80% are delayed. Um, and as we move through the immunotherapy space, we've all seen the articles of a lot of opportunity in drugs, but perhaps too few patients. So one area we were asked to work on up at Kraft was um, evaluating and really studying platform trials, which is such an exciting place to be. And we all know the beautiful work that's been done by people like Laura Esserman or the Beat AML study that's been going on um, or LungMap. Um, so what we decided to do was um, getting all of their wisdom was to actually also look at a number of platform trials that were going on real time right now. And I really do want to thank the warriors that actually work with us every week, chief medical officers in this space, to share their information, their timelines, their data, so we could understand you know, the performance indices around these studies. So that was Brian Alexander on GPM Agile, Daniel Clair on My Drug, and Victoria Maddox on Precision Promise. Thanks to their thoughtfulness, we really worked with them to say, here are the four challenges we see in um, working on master protocols, and we'll be publishing that information and bringing it to an FDA meeting as well. And it's interesting, too, because we're also finding this in the IO space, and CRI was uh, great at working with us on this project as well. So you'll start to see where we move in terms of solutions to platform trials. And as we do that, we're also continuing to work on our fourth work stream. This work stream is really chaired by Richard and myself, which is the venture space. We all know that there's a lot of money going into um, healthcare today, which is a great thing, whether it's coming in from philanthropy into AMCs. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of really new and exciting models um, starting to appear in venture. So we're familiar with what happened with cystic fibrosis, but there's also a great model being supported by JDRF that we've been following. We look at the for-profit models like Solid and Endeavor. 
uh, cancer mega funds with people like Andrew Lowe, but we've also been studying all the funds from UBS, or the ones being done at the academic centers like Dana Farber. So um, what Richard and I will be doing is uh, hosting an event in the first quarter, really studying all of the venture approaches, identifying the best practices in the space, but then also in an exciting way, looking for areas where funds have not yet been identified and how we can move forward. So when you look at the problem we're solving on the venture piece, an immediate effort of how do we work with some of the disease foundations real time to get their venture philanthropy up and running in a really rapid way. It could be through the JDRF model, a separate LLC, and then simultaneously moving into the first quarter, really looking at some of these novel fund ideas that are out there and pushing those forward as well. So what you saw from all of this was four work streams, highly integrated, um, and the way we do a lot of this work is by constantly looking for what's going on in the ecosystem and trying to bring as many groups as we can together in oncology but across a number of diseases. And Richard and I saw this firsthand the week of Labor Day when we hosted our first executive education program to a somewhat sellout crowd up here, which was so rewarding. Um, these were the case studies we looked at, answer funds, impact investing, platform trials um, from the GBM Agile payer programs, and all of that was taught up here across um, many different people in the ecosystem. So we had pharma companies, biotech companies, payers, academic centers, and everybody came up with a precision medicine problem that they were trying to solve for in the executive education space. I will tell you a key taking, uh, takeaway from that event was how much everybody was struggling on the data side, and it was one of the reasons that we knew this effort with Faster Cures would be so exciting for all of you. No matter where you are in precision medicine, you have to be able to figure out the data elements of it. So that makes me um, incredibly excited to share with you that um, Gabriel Eichler is joining us, and he chairs, as I said, the, um, the data work stream with us. Um, he has such a great background, um, having founded Oak Health Partners, but also having worked at GNS and patients like me. And I've had the honor of working side by side with him for the past year. Um, and it's a really treat, a big treat to see all the work that he's done. So um, thank you again for all of your time. Um, I hope that you stay interested and you continue to follow us at um, HBS Health. And if we can answer questions at the end, I'll look forward to that as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gabriel. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, pleasure to be here today, everybody, and uh, looking forward to presenting some of the work that I've been doing uh, through most of this year. I'm going to start off by talking about some of the work we've done on uh, real-world data landscapes and where the real-world data resides currently in the ecosystem. And then the latter part of my talk will focus on some of the work we've done looking at real-world data anal analytics companies and both the applications they're working on as well as sort of looking at a bit of a who's who in that space. First off, just to set the stage a bit, you know, I want to make note here that I, I think a, a useful recipe for any uh, practitioner in this space is to think about the integration of three primary ingredients as a recipe for building out data-driven insights. The first is, of course, a, a well-defined question um, that is answerable given the data you uh, have access to. It is specific. Uh, there's many aspects of that. Um, and we're actually not going to focus on the question side today, but of course, that's some of the most important uh, aspects of what we do. The second part is a data source and a rich data source that can be, um, you know, uh, uh, has the resolution and the fidelity to be able to answer the questions at hand. And the third is, of course, an analytical methodology, which obviously AI and machine learning have become uh, increasingly interesting um, sort of developments and areas of innovation, but there's also just tremendous body of literature around um, statistics and other types of uh, analytical methodologies that, you know, oftentimes are quite aptly applied as well. And what comes out of this recipe, interestingly, is not answers, rather, I should emphasize here, it is hypotheses. So oftentimes people want to look to data and take answers directly out of retrospective data. I think that that is uh, very possibly a, uh, a path that we can be aiming for, but ultimately at this day and age where we are is that the data can at best yield hypotheses. And that in and of itself is um, valuable in reducing the possible set of hypotheses that can be tested and helping to suggest the key hypotheses. But I just want to emphasize here, nobody walks away from these projects with the answers to everything that they would dream for, rather a new place to start. 
Um, in 2016, we did some work on a data landscape that I actually inherited, um, looking at the sources of real-world data um, uh, you know, across the ecosystem of oncology. Um, I'll show a bigger version of the slide uh, graphic contained herein. Um, the focus of that was looking at the longitudinality and openness and the funding sources for those data sets. And of course, we looked at data sets across the spectrum of all sizes and types. Uh, but since that landscape was done, obviously there's been a tremendous amount of additional momentum in the space. New data assets are becoming available on a commercial and open scales. Uh, there's been new registries and platform trials that have burgeoned and created additional data. Um, and then we're also seeing a tremendous amount of investment go into this space. And so we realized in late 2017, it would be a phenomenal thing to try to update this landscape and revisit some of these same themes. So in the 2018 landscape, we focused a little bit differently, looking at uh, not per se the same aspects of the 2016 landscape, but rather we were really interested to know who is actually integrating molecular, clinical, and longitudinal data um, into uh, single data assets, because that we feel like is much more of the complete picture that's required for a lot of the real world insights people are seeking. Um, likewise, we wanted to look at and explore how accessible and link of all these types of data assets were. And then we also tried to focus on the data assets that were the most significant in size or focus uh, and really did not focus on the smaller assets or the emerging assets quite as much as the 2016 landscape. So as I said, this is some of the work that came out of the 2016 landscape here that you're seeing. Um, this work is available as well on the website um, of the CRAFT program if anybody would like a copy of this landscape. Um, and this was actually what we came up with after doing the 2018 landscape. And I want to call uh, your attention to a few aspects of what you're seeing here. First of all, the horizontal axis is looking at the degree of dimensionality and curation in the data assets. Um, you know, as many people have uh, experienced and relate to, um, the data coming out of a clinical environment from the EMR is typically very unstructured and difficult to analyze through computational means. So the degree of curation and as well the degree of integration of multiple data types and streams is essential to having a really actionable and valuable data asset. And we're seeing here on the horizontal that we've played out and explored that spectrum. On the vertical, we're really looking at how are these data sets becoming accessible to various partners. And I wanted to call attention here that the horizontal, where the horizontal and the vertical axes meet, um, Obviously, above that line, those data assets are increasingly publicly available. Um, the reason that I'm, I'm drawing a distinction here um, among those on the top of the chart versus those in the bottom as to whether or not these are even commercially available. So just because it's above the line doesn't mean it's free, but it does mean that one could purchase it or one could engage with it on a research setting in the right context. And I think that that's um, a nice dimension that we're seeing, which is that many of the data assets are increasingly becoming publicly available. Um, you've also note that the red borders around the lines indicate whether these data assets are either linked or would support the linkage to other data assets on an individual patient-by-patient -patient level, of course, in a HIPAA compliant and PHAI sensitive uh, uh, approach. Um, and then lastly, I'll point out on this, which is interesting, is that we put a lot of the smaller, very niche registries like BDAML, LungMap, iSpy, and MMRF's work all the way to the right-hand side because those data assets are very, very tailored to specific diseases. And the, I would say, focus of what they do uh, leads us to feel like they have very superior data assets with regard to their single diseases, whereas a lot of the large balls of flat iron through IQVIA and CancerLink are general data assets that may have a lot more all-comers. And, uh, you know, those data assets can also be valuable, but they're just not quite as um, specific and niche-oriented as, as others. Um, one learning I wanted to share here in talking to, you know, upwards of 50 AMCs for this project and many organizations that are collecting data is that many people think about AMCs as having, you know, let's say a flower shop worth of data that anybody should be able to come in there as a researcher with a legitimate question and pluck off some of the data and have a bouquet of that data to analyze and work with as they need and neat, accessible, clean, and ready-to-go data assets. The reality, though, is that I think that we should think about AMC data assets from a different perspective. And the analogy I use here is that it's like a field of wildflowers. Yes, all the flowers are present, but the collection, collation, cleaning, and preparation of the actual flowers is actually a time-consuming and expensive effort. 
And I think that it's important that we both respect and appreciate that challenge and acknowledge that, you know, funding is necessary sometimes on the AMZ side in order to cover the costs of reaping and harvesting those, uh, those resources for the purpose of research questions like ours often. Um, a few observations I wanted to just share as well on the 2018 data landscape, and I'll go through these rather quickly because we have a lot more to get through here. Um, the first is that between 2016 and the 2018 landscape, we saw a median improvement in size in the data assets of about 25%, and many data assets now are exceeding a million patients in size. Um, likewise, I think the curation game has been well-defined, both through the efforts of folks like Flatiron and many other organizations that are investing in that space, and that curation has dramatically improved the value and the accessibility of the data sets that they've created. Um, likewise, the patient registries, um, I think, also play a very strong role, as I mentioned two slides prior. In terms of sharing and linking models, um, we think that this is actually a tremendously exciting and rich area that many organizations are acknowledging that they may have the keys to an important component of the patient care and journey that these patients go on, but they typically don't have all the data. And so acknowledgement of the linking and the contractual requirements that that entails is I think a real positive progress on the space and that we're seeing several models listed here that I want to just call out. Likewise, when we were engaging with these organizations, we asked them about their willingness and ability to share and to link their data assets. And from my, I'd say, informal view of this space, I'm increasingly noting that these companies are acknowledging that they have to be willing to and need to engage in linking activities. And so, you know, there may sometimes be technical or privacy hurdles that are hard to uh, overcome, especially for a long-term data asset that may not have baked that into the consent. But for many others, this is something that they're quickly uh, moving towards and something I think that will continue. And then lastly, um, on this slide, I wanted to point out that there's still many frontiers in this space which I think are tremendously exciting. I think that the linkage of these data assets to real-world specimens whether they be blood or tissue, is in a really exciting frontier that would enable not just um, the, it would enable the better archive and retrieval of specimen, as well as more uh, real uh, studies on actual specimen for the creation of diagnostics and other types of uh, disease models. I think the collection of raw imaging, including uh, data sets that could be used in radiomics applications is also extremely exciting both in terms of uh, pathology imaging as well as uh, radiation imaging um, that, that, that's used of uh, physiology. Um, patient recontact rights are incredibly important. Oftentimes, patients, uh, you know, we can build analytics and get tremendous results, but there's always a handful of patients that don't quite fit into the model. And so one always wonders which are those patients and why those patients aren't being modeled correctly by the algorithm. And one source of that error is oftentimes where the data was miscollected or not annotated properly for some caveats. And so the patient recontact rights are a tremendous opportunity to be able to engage with the physician and the patients more. And in, in ensuring that we do this in a compliant and uh, uh, appropriate fashion is one that I think is a frontier of, of much research and, and innovation. And then lastly, I want to point to some improvements of data standards, which I think are coming and I think is a real opportunity for improvement and something that we've been thinking a lot here about how we can improve the standards of real-world data so that these data assets can be more easily combined and brought in touch with each other. Um, I wanted to shift gears, if I can, to some of the aspects and work we've been doing on the real-world data landscapes. Um, this space has been tremendously exciting to watch from the outside and to participate in. Um, you know, obviously, there's been real uh, excitement on the headlines of this, I'd say. People are holding out tremendous promise for what AI can do to healthcare. Um, I think, though, that uh, you know, the reality is, is that we can get ahead of ourselves a little bit easily here and that there can often be some um, excessive exuberance, if you will, or some hype that we need to acknowledge may be present in the, in, in, in the current discussions today. And we wanted to spend some time kind of parsing through what's out there today, who the leaders are, and what these folks are, are working on. So as you can tell, there's, you know, as Kathy pointed to, a similar cloud of, um, of, of, of icons from these organizations and logos. Um, there's a tremendous number of companies in this space. Um, I'll bet you most people on the call haven't heard of at least some of the organizations on this slide. And I wanted to spend some time helping you to understand 
what it is that these organizations do and uh, which ones may be emerging as the leaders in this next generation of AI applications to healthcare. So our objective here was to really reach this core set of stakeholders of investors, nonprofits, researchers, and hospitals, payers, and patients to help them answer questions about, um, you know, where are advanced analytics like AI and machine learning being most aptly applied? Um, who may be a suitable investment target that is really on a roll and, and, and a company that uh, we should expect uh, some exciting news out of in the coming years? Um, is it best to build, buy, or to partner with these organizations? You know, this is a big question about whether or not these innovations are best done within the four walls of an organization or whether they're best done through uh, partnership. And then when these technologies may be ready for real-world applications. I think that there's a tremendous hurdle that we've seen in uh, wet lab uh, R&D with regard to translational biology and translational clinical sciences. And I think that in many ways, health IT and uh, health technologies like this also have a similar hurdle of being translated into the clinical environment. And, uh, you know, it's always a question about what that hurdle looks like with any new modality, and that's one that we're watching closely here at the CRAFT program. So when we looked at this space, we decided to break down the application areas into a handful, uh, roughly six different uh, use cases where AI and machine learning are, 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 are being aptly applied. Um, obviously, there's one about looking at target identification and biomarkers as well as some of the chemoinformatic applications. There's applications more directly to the end-to-end -end drug discovery preclinical research. Um, there's applications to introducing of the identification of patients for clinical trials and then the downstream analysis of the results that come out of clinical trials. And then lastly, there's applications to the clinical pathways and decision support that are required in the clinic and then the population health and value-based care analytics that oftentimes are increasingly becoming uh, part of the conversation. So I wanted to, if I could, spend some time talking about these applications with these organizations. And I'll tell you what we did here. We looked at about 46 companies across the space. Most of these companies are U.S.-based, but not entirely. Um, we pulled together lists from wherever we could find them on the Internet, on web searches, on uh, industry reports, and came up with this list of organizations doing interesting things. Um, we unfortunately recognized that the methodology we wanted to use for analysis wouldn't really work great for companies that were um, sort of either too complex or too small and insufficiently uh, annotated by what they do to really pull them up into this. So I acknowledge that there's organizations that um, we had trouble sort of parsing through and prioritizing in our analysis, but I'll show you what we did anyway with the other companies, the 46 I listed on the prior slide. We looked at the degree to which these organizations were uh, experiencing and demonstrating um, hallmarks of recent acceleration in their business through recent financing, um, the percentage of job growth they've experienced over the past 12 months, and then the number or percentage of open positions that they have at the company. Um, and then, of course, we uh, explored this uh, relative to the establishment uh, metrics for these organizations, such as the total number of publications which they have, the numbers of partners and customers which they speak publicly about, and, of course, the total funding which they've gotten to date. And, of course, um, when you put this onto a two-by-two -two type matrix, you can actually see some interesting patterns emerge because, of course, there's companies that are the industry standards which are highly established but really not accelerating so fast anymore. And there's organizations which are emerging, um, but not necessarily established because they're really just coming out of the gate and accelerating early on. But we think that the companies up here, which both have size, critical mass, and acceleration are tremendously interesting because these are, these are the companies that we think may be uh, breaking out of the mold and really innovating in exciting ways that the market is realizing. So when you put this um, all together, we, you know, want to just make a note of a few limitations here, the first of which is that obviously this is very U.S. focused. Um, we're quantifying the entire organization, and I break it down by capabilities, but of course it's hard to do that. Um, this is a trailing indicator of the company status, and of course as new news emerges, these metrics may uh, change dramatically. Um, and then of course any real breakthroughs are sometimes hard to capture in this model, but I'll show you what we found. This is the landscape uh, that's put on that two-by-two two matrix of the 46 companies which we spoke to. Uh, again, the y-axis being the establishment, and the, it's a percentile. Uh, and then uh, relative to that cohort, we also have the accelerating percentile of the same organizations. 
And so you're seeing here, interestingly, not surprisingly, that there are a number of companies that are both in the upper left-hand quadrant and in the lower right-hand quadrant, which is, you know, as I said before, somewhat to be expected because those are the typical modalities of where the space would be. And likewise, we're seeing very few companies down in the lower left-hand corner, which makes good sense because this is truly an industry which is growing and emerging and very exciting time and place for that. On the flip side, though, the organizations, as I said before, which are up here are the ones that are truly interesting from our perspective and we'll be diving deep into uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So if I look at the companies that claim and speak about their work in biomarker and target IDs, um, a few of them stand out, and I want to just call out some of those organizations, um, if I can, in this sort of a format, and I'll go through all the applications in the same way. So the first is Tempest, which many folks have probably read about. Um, this is a company founded by the Groupon founder, Eric Lipskowski, um, and he has raised a tremendous amount of money at what now exceeds a $2 billion valuation. Um, he, along with Precision Health AI, have licensed the CancerLink data asset from ASCO and have been asked to commercialize it um, with many organizations. They partnered with hundreds of hospitals and they claim to have over 2 million clinical records at their hands and disposal, in addition to all the molecular data which they generate in-house now at Tempest. So a very exciting model and one that I think is turning a lot of heads because of its momentum. Benevolent AI, another organization which has, I think, reached a lot of um, sort of uh, minds of folks probably on the line and people are hearing a lot about. Um, they've raised a tremendous amount of money as well and uh, have exceeded the $2 billion valuation as well, which is an incredibly high threshold for such a, a young company. They were awarded some accolades from the World Economic Forum recently, and they are growing in size tremendously fast with about 140 page, uh, people in the organization with a 75% year-over-year growth rate. Um, the third one I would actually be surprised if everybody's heard about, but is an interesting one called Recursion Pharma. Um, this company partners with all sorts of um, industry organizations, including Sanofi and academics like UCSD, um, and they've raised what, uh, you know, by comparison looks like a paltry amount of uh, only $105 million with a $60 million raise in October of last year. But obviously this is a company which has some real momentum and we're keeping an eye on as well. In terms of drug discovery companies, um, and these are companies, again, that are attempting to make true uh, breakthrough uh, uh, um, um, work in um, regard to end-to-end -end bioinformatics, chemoinformatics, and preclinical work. Um, I want to call out a few of them here, including Atomwise, um, which is a, um, you know, company that prizes itself on making new molecules for the hardest targets, uh, the so-called undruggables. Um, they were recently featured on a list of the Disrupt 100, and so it's nice to see that they actually fall out on the high end of our list given uh, this use case. Um, they're actually quite small in size, under 30 people, and they have, though, a tremendously rich growth rate of 150% year-on-year. Deep Genomics, also an interesting company of modest size, 30 employees, uh, and they've raised, again, uh, you know, around $13 million uh, last year. But interestingly, they're getting money from uh, pretty top-tier investors like Coastal Ventures, among other uh, top-rated organizations. Um, and then lastly, uh, 2XR, I'm not sure how to say that, is an intelligence-driven um, uh, drug discovery company, also quite young, also raising modest amounts of money given the space, but again, from SoftBank and Andreessen Horwitz, which are both top-tier tech and healthcare investors. Um, they have pretty impressive and ambitious bio and chemoinformatics applications which they're developing, and again, a modest size of employees, but um, given how they're approaching it and the um, interest that they've garnered from uh, top-tier investors in the competitive space, I'm also quite interested to see how they shake out in the coming uh, years. Um, an application, as I mentioned before, of interest, and I want to just call out one company here in particular, is around uh, clinical trial patient ID. Um, and this is one of these breakthrough technologies which is trying to integrate both genomic signatures with facial recognition technologies to identify patients with rare diseases. Oftentimes those rare diseases can manifest themselves in skin color or facial structure and deformity, and um, they are partnering with all sorts of organizations globally, actually, on trying to bring this technology to bear. They've been partnering with many genomic organizations uh, doing a lot of work in that space, and I think it's an incredibly exciting and uh, innovative platform. And, you know, the, the jury's still out whether they're going to be able to uh, translate that into some real practical applications, but at least for the clinical trial ID side, this could be quite interesting. 
Um, in terms of clinical trial analysis companies, um, two that I want to call out here in particular were AI Cure and NuMedi. Um, AI Cure was again uh, nicely to see in my research uh, named on the AI 100 list as one of the most exciting companies in the space, uh, a modest 50 employees growing 30% year over year. Um, and NuMedi has a series of applications that they work on, but part of that is actually looking at clinical trials. And I wanted to call them out here because they've uh, landed at a whole bunch of really innovative partners through um, Allergan, Astellis, uh, BI, Yale, and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and they have a tremendous amount of thought leadership published from both their founders uh, and their partners uh, with the technology they licensed out of a tool, Butte's Lab at Stanford. Um, some of the companies on the clinical pathways and decision support side that I wanted to call out, um, one of which is Mitra Biotech, um, which has, you know, really founded itself around trying to deliver precision cancer treatments. Uh, they had a pretty large raise in the uh, $40 million range earlier this summer, and they as well have been working with the uh, juggernaut Glenmark Pharma out of India. Um, you know, they have been growing uh, larger than 25% uh, year over year, which is exciting. And then lastly, Wuxi Next Code, which, you know, has, I think, probably takes the list for the highest amount of money raised by any company on this list at $240 million uh, around a year ago as of now. Um, and they, of course, were also noted as one of Fast Company's 10 most uh, innovative companies. So I think that that's also a company to be watching over the uh, coming years as well. Uh, I think lastly on this list I wanted to go through was two companies, um, both Coda and Shift. Um, Coda is a real-world um, uh, data and analytics company. They were actually featured on the data analytics uh, and the data landscape that I showed earlier in the call. Um, Coda has raised $40 million and um, really has been, I'd say, a, one of the leaders in the real-world data space, uh, partnering with hospitals, structuring their data, and helping to make it accessible for downstream analytics, uh, and then also integrating on the analytics as well. And so they do a lot of work around population health and value-based care analytics as part of their own uh, offerings. And lastly, Shift, which initially was in our um, analysis when we started this work, but then it was acquired by Medidata. We left them as an independent organization to call out for now. Um, you know, they were acquired in June of 2018, um, and they, of course, are working with numerous organizations on analyzing and bringing analytics to uh, the data sets of those organizations. Really exciting and beautiful product. Um, in closing, I wanted to just share some sort of high-level observations about this landscape. So the first off, if you look at the companies across the um, profiles that I've uh, analyzed, there was about $1.4 billion raised by these companies in the landscape. That's a tremendous amount. And in the past 12 months, uh, nearly half a billion dollars was raised, uh, which is very, very exciting and I think underscores how bullish investors are about uh, some major value-creating outcomes, whether those be exits, acquisitions, or other types of um, uh, um, outcomes for these companies. Um, it's also interesting because if you look back at some of the slides I've shared, many companies are applying their technology to multiple use cases, suggesting that the core and capabilities of working with these data and performing AI on top of these data are, um, you know, uh, applications which can be used in many different ways. And I think that, you know, these companies are still figuring out where best to aim their tools and capabilities, and that will continue to play out over the coming years. It also suggests that there's a diversity of business models here. Some of these organizations are developing their own drugs, some are partnering to develop drugs, some are offering services, some are offering software. And those different types of capabilities show that there's still some, uh, you know, uh, let's say diversity in how these organizations are approaching uh, the business models they're trying to serve. And then lastly, I want to say that I think that there's really paradigm shifting potential here. And what I mean by that is that these companies are young. I think they're going to take a few years to mature and to demonstrate what they can do. And I think that to the extent to which these companies have breakthroughs, whether that be an approved drug, whether that be a drug that is rescued because a failed clinical trial gets reanalyzed, a biomarker gets identified, and that drug then goes on to approval, these are the type of stories that these organizations, I think, are apt to be creating and to be writing for themselves. And that in the next few months, we're going to start to see, um, you know, the traction and the progress these organizations are making. And I would not be surprised to see some real breakthroughs on real disease, rare disease diagnostics, preclinical informatics, trial designs, and execution as part of this. 
And so, um, you know, again, I'm looking, and, and I think that the reason I call this paradigm shifting is because this would be a profound shift that many folks in the industry would recognize uh, and, and as potentially a, a redefinition of some of these activities if indeed it's demonstrated that advanced analytics can be uh, so breakthrough and transformative to, uh, to the, uh, the objectives. Um, I want to just uh, extend my thanks to the folks that have been part of this work, both on the craft program side, on the faster cures side, um, and then of course the folks that have been so instrumental in creating the data landscape and the analytics landscape that we put together here today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Tanisha for uh, questions. Gabriel and Kathy, thank you so much. I just want, I know for me, this has been such an amazing uh, last half hour, just getting a sense for where you are in terms of the data and AI analytic landscape. Um, we had, I want to thank folks that had submitted questions earlier. I have a few questions that have been pre-submitted. And so let me start there. Uh, let's start with the first question. What are the actionable implications of all this information to the folks who are on the line who are either funding, conducting, or investing in R&D? And let's just begin with what an organization like MMRF would do with this information. So maybe, Kathy, if you could start, that would be great. Sure, yeah, I'd love to. So I think, um, you know, having worked side by side with, with Gabriel and a few other of the AI companies, um, you know, we're huge believers in the data space and understanding where data is. Um, you saw from the landscape that we have a, um, a compass study, which is, as Gabriel said, is very focused on myeloma patients. Um, it's, you know, a longitudinal genomic clinical, but it's a hypothesis generating study. So in order for us to validate what we want to keep working on, we have to know where the other data sets are that are out there. And when we're trying to validate different areas, we have to understand which AI company we're working with. So, you know, and we put this together in, in a case study called the Answer Fund where, you know, if we're talking with patients, they may want, they have questions about, should I be on maintenance? Should I be on transplant? And we have to work to understand, you know, what should you do in your subtype? How do you make those decisions? If we're working with academic centers, it may be more on the subtype space. How do we build that out in the basic biology? And with pharma, targets, biomarkers. So we're constantly scouring for new data. We're constantly looking for new AI companies to be working with us. Um, and we work with a number of the groups that are already on this page. And then we've used a lot of this information. We'll be launching an entirely new program called CureCloud at the end of this year with a number of the partners that um, you'll have seen from Gabriel's presentation. Um, and we're really excited to do that. It includes the patient registry and even trying to get all of us to move to the immune space. So. I'm happy to share all of that once all the contracts and things are signed. Um, but this has been incredible for us to sit side by side and watch all this information come through. And, and as I mentioned before, you know, working with Gabriel, where even HBS students trying to get through all of this data was, was no easy feat, but it's the joy of being up here. Um, there's nothing more important to us than sharing, you know, what we're all learning. Um, we've interviewed a lot of these companies, but um, you know, everybody has different ideas. I think that's where Gabriel's workshop will be really eye-opening to see how is everybody using an AI company data to solve a very specific use case and problem, whether you're a payer, an academic center, or a patient foundation. Great. Gabriel, anything you want to add to that or elaborate on? No, I mean, I think that Kathy spoke um, very aptly about how organizations like hers are using the data sets like this. Um, you know, I think that all organizations, uh, especially philanthropy, are trying to figure out their role in how they bring real-world data into the mix, how they both sponsor the collection and the analysis of it. Um, you know, another role which I, I want to point out here that MMRF has been a leader on, and I think many other organizations are starting to see as well, and I alluded to this earlier, is that there is no shortage um, of challenge in trying to define the right questions to ask. And I think that um, a lot of the work that MMRF has been doing and other organizations are trying to follow in their footsteps has been around asking, sort of defining, prioritizing, and asking the key questions in their disease which are going to unlock the most progress in helping patients. And whether that's about, you know, and what's amazing is that when you ask patients, you actually get different questions than when you ask clinicians. And so you can't just ask one constituent group and expect them to speak for the others because 
many times patients are asking about, asking about the practicalities of different ways of treating their disease and aspects of quality of life and side effect profiles that maybe are subclinical, but they actually have a profound impact on how the patient experienced the treatment of their disease. And so I think that, um, you know, that's also a place which is really exciting in this area is both capturing and defining those key questions for the future of innovation in the disease. That's great, Gabriel. I want to move on to the second question, um, which is really about what's coming up next. And I think we heard a little bit about this in both of your presentations. But in particular, how, what's coming up next and how do we want to view this pillar around data analytics and its relationship with the other three areas that I know you're advancing there at Craft? Mm -hmm. So I, I would say when you watch where we're headed, um, everybody is dealing, trying to figure out the data space. And so that workshop on the data piece will become critically important in first quarter. Um, but you are right. I mean, we have to understand how you use data to also drive venture. So, you know, one of the questions we get up here all the time is, is it, you know, you want to have as many shots on goal as you can, but you want to make sure that the best shots on goal too. And so a lot of the work we're doing on venture is also tied to how do we use data in a better space to pick our investments. So that's a lot of what we'll be working on at our February meeting. And if people have venture models that they didn't hear me discuss that they think are compelling, by all means, let us know. I think the other um, places that we end up really focusing too and where things are coming up is, you know, this team has done a beautiful job on platform trials, sharing their information of what makes them tick and what can be the challenges behind them. So when this publication comes out, we'll make sure everybody gets a copy of it. It's just, it's not, you know, mind blowing to know that there's four major challenges they all face, but I think it's just good practice to read this and then hear directly from you know, the people that we're working with, Victoria and Daniel and others, to say, um, this is where I got stuck and, you know, we don't want you to pay the dumb tax, as we call it. Like, when you do your platform trial, we want you to get these four things right. Um, and, and I think that will be, you know, really helpful. So a lot of our ideas um, that we work on at Craft, we work on them as these work streams that you just heard about with a work stream leader. We're on call, you know, for some of these work groups every week, and we've been doing it like Lloyd Marcus with a direct to patient group for, you know, for over a year now, and it shows. Um, but what you want to be aware of, and if you're in our database and working with Faster Cures now, you'll know when all of our workshops are happening that are open meetings, you'll also know exactly when we're communicating and disseminating our solutions through publications. We'll make you aware of all of our case studies, anything we're doing in the executive education programs, because the whole point of this is um, to make sure we know where best practices are happening, where the white space is that we all need to be working together. And while we can't have 400 people in a room because we'll never get anything done, we want to make sure we're disseminating it as fast as we possibly can. I think my greatest frustration of, you know, working at the MMRF was we knew a lot and so many other groups were even smarter than we were, but there was never an easy way for all of us to get together and share that knowledge. And I think that's really what um, Robert and Jonathan's craft intent was, let's share as much information as we can, real time, across cancers, across diseases, and have a much better impact. That's great. You know, I know we're focused on precision medicine here today, and oftentimes we think about it only restricted to cancer, but to your point, precision medicine is the direction that all diseases are heading in in the future. Um, I wanted to take a step back because, Kathy, I think you, as, a, as, a, as somebody who's been such a pioneer in the space of venture philanthropy and in the, in the role that patient organizations can play to catalyze an entire environment, one of my uh, aha moments in listening to you, Gabriel, is that the AI and data market is extraordinarily hot. It receives a lot of private sector investment. Um, and when you think about the role of disease foundations, they play an, a critical role in creating rich data sets that are a complement to the massive clinical data sets that we see in academic medical centers. How do you see both the role of the patient organizations in its contribution to data, but also its contribution from a philanthropic venture philanthropy perspective? Well, I, I think there's two ways. One, I think the patient groups can really serve as trusted third parties. So they can help to prioritize the questions that really need to be answered. And then they can find sometimes the use case may be only interesting to one part of the ecosystem. Other times the use case may be interesting to the entire ecosystem. Where I've really seen this happen is with MRD, um, where 
everybody benefited because in myeloma, the patients didn't necessarily want to be on maintenance therapy if they were in a complete remission. And in academia and in, in, in industry, they were looking for a surrogate endpoint. So all of a sudden you see, you know, a number of data sets coming together and that's where you can be a trusted third party and keep identifying that sweet spot of where data can align and, you know, really take a leadership role as a third party to move that forward on behalf of everybody. I think then how you tie that back into venture is to start making sure that we look at some of these models that are out there and that you're fueling what's going on at GDR, JDRF or, you know, when we teach MMRF or LLS and all these groups how to do the venture piece, make sure you're also tying it to what are the priorities you see. An example we keep using is in immunotherapy, not every cancer is going to be the same. Some of us may really care about CAR Ts, others may care about bites, others care about checkpoints. Without the data, you don't know where to make the investment. So we're really trying to push the data and tie it to the venture piece as well. One thing right. I want to add here. Oh, go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, what, one thing I wanted to add was that I, I feel like the role of the nonprofits also can serve as um, a platform to disseminate these key questions and also serve as matchmaker between the data owners, oftentimes AMCs or other registries, with the analytics companies. Um, and I think that helping those organizations both find each other and focus in on this key question that the um, nonprofit wants answered is really valuable. These organizations have tremendous capabilities when it comes to analytics but oftentimes don't quite know the science or the biology, the clinical aspects as well. And the help with the uh, nonprofit can really help drive a focus towards those key questions and uh, both funding and, and, and partners to do it with. I want to thank Kathy and Gabriel for their, for their wisdom today, for sharing all the learnings. I, for those of you that have joined us and those of you that I know have colleagues that wanted to tune in, this webinar is being recorded and we invite you to access the archived version of this website on our website. It'll be posted in the next 24 hours. And I know Kathy and Gabriel have a rich amount of resources on their website as well um, that they have made available to the public. For us here at Fashion Cures, one of our core missions, as many of you all know, is that for over the last 15 years, building this community of leaders who are really pushing the envelope, like Kraft is and like Kathy Gabriel, is part of our core mission. And I really thank you all for being with us today. Um, like I said earlier, this idea of health data and where we're going as a society around health data and increasing the participation of all of us in research is really critical. Please visit our website at healthdatabasics.org. Master protocols are an incredibly important aspect of what many people are thinking about, including our friends at Kraft. Uh, we have a webinar coming up in December around uh, a name, so you want to start a master protocol trial. The registration for this webinar will be open. It's open on our website now. And then finally, if you'd like to stay connected to Fast Recurs and stay in the know about our latest developments, please subscribe to our Smart Brief or follow us online on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Tumblr, or on our website. Thank you all so much for participating in the webinar. Thank you, Kathy and Gabriel. We look forward to our continued partnership with Kraft, and see you next time.